And that was actually the first time that I've rage quit from the OSCP labs. I just completely was like, I, I can't, I can't keep doing this. This episode was sponsored by Audible. Audible is the leading platform for audiobooks with a massive variety of choices. I personally use Audible every time I travel or just have a bit of downtime. A book I've been listening to recently is Michael Pillsbury's The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. I'm going to leave a link in the description for the audiobook, as well as a link to sign up for a seven-day free trial to Audible. What's going on, guys? It's been quite a bit. I will uh, go into a little bit of detail about why it's been so long. I'm going. I'm not going to say officially back on schedule for YouTube stuff, because that's probably a promise I can't keep. But I am at least going to be upla- uploading as regularly as I had talked about before. The reason why it's been a while is because Comcast is the worst. Literally, they I, I called them a day after I moved in and asked them to come and hook my internet up, expecting like a day or two. It was 10. They were going to take 10 days to come over and hook up my internet. I explained that I work from home and that I really need internet, and they explained that there was nothing they could do. For about 10 days, I was working out of a coffee shop, trying to get as much done with the OSCP as possible, and I gave that up after about day two. Doing OSCP on my laptop, even after I had transferred all of my notes and all of that off of my desktop, it was nigh on impossible. I mean, not having a decent internet connection and just working at a coffee shop and trying to concentrate just wasn't working for me. Um, Work also got incredibly busy around that time, so it just wasn't really all that doable. That kind of added to my already, you know, mounting anxiety about the OSCP. I um, was nervous before I had a 10 day, you know, mandatory off period, basically. And then I realized that I was wasting a full 10 days. And then when I came back, I was like, okay, you know, I'll just refocus. I've got this. And when I went back to it, I had 12 days left. I thought I had around 20, 25. So the anxiety after realizing that was just unbelievable you know realizing how much i still had to get done in such a short period of time you know i i knew that it was doable from the beginning it was just daunting realizing that i had to get that much done in that short of a period of time so the the couple of days after that basically were you know the first day was you know basically me saying i'm going to refocus I'm going to make sure that I really get a lot of work done and I'm going to make sure that, you know, I I learn a lot because I've got 12 days to absorb as much as humanly possible. That first day was awful. I banged my head against the wall for about 16 plus hours that day until about 3 a.m. that night or, or that morning, I guess, the next morning and just did not get anything done. I I don't know why I just was bouncing between boxes, just, you know, trying to get something and it just didn't work. You know, I wasn't focusing on one box in particular, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it, it, I just hit a complete wall that first day. The second day, I went into it with a lot of anxiety and was just trying to kind of make way more progress than I did the day before. I basically just counted that as another lost day, and I got a shell or two that day. The third day, which was yesterday, was unbelievable. I don't I don't know exactly what happened, just something clicked on a couple of different boxes and I ended up with I think half a dozen probably half a dozen to 10 shells yesterday, just very easily. A couple of them took me 15 minutes, a couple of them were a bit quicker. And it was just absolutely unreal just, you know, the the difference between day 1 and day 3. Um, today I've been out running errands and all of that. It's the weekend, so I kind of have to get some housework done, but I plan on just probably pulling a not an all-nighter, but a most-nighter tonight, and doing pretty much training all day tomorrow as well. So um, to kind of move into the practical section, you know, what what did I learn over the last couple of days? A, there are a lot of blogs that say don't, you know, don't, don't get kind of gummed down in one box, to bounce back and forth if you can't find anything on one box and move on to another one. And I think that that's true in a lot of cases, but it's certainly a piece of advice that can be abused. So if you're constantly bouncing between boxes and not making it anywhere on any of them, 
then you're wasting your time really i mean it's you're just not going to be able to really make progress unless you magically find a box it's got like a one-off exploit and you're done i i would recommend spend a little bit more time on each box before giving up and moving on to another one there are legitimate cases where you need to move on to another one you're just not going to find anything and that's fine but certainly give it a little bit more time than you're probably willing to and don't give up as quickly as you probably want to the second one is actually a little bit more practical than that. Obviously, I've been talking a whole lot about the enumeration phases in each one of these vlogs. The thing that I realized was that I've been neglecting directory brute force programs like Derb and uh, Deerbuster. So those actually were probably the reason behind at least half of the boxes that I've broken in the last couple of days, simply because they don't just find directories, they find services as well. So if you find a service like a web app or something like that using Derb, a lot of times that's just a new exploitation vector. A couple of those you know, times I found a web app that was running on the machine that I didn't realize was running before, and it literally had a point and click to get root exploit, and it took 10 minutes, you know, it was that easy. So that, that definitely, is something that um, I would recommend paying attention to. Don't don't neglect things like Deer, uh, Deerbuster and Derb. Um, basically, what those are is they're just uh, directory brute force programs that test the presence of different directories, like common directories on a web server. And they're incredibly useful because they don't, like I said, they don't just find directories; they find services and web apps and things like that, um, as well as administration um, panels. And you know, a lot of those just have very weak and easy passwords. Another thing. Go ahead and test like the easiest five passwords that you've got in your head. So password, password one, two, three, pass one, two, three, admin, administrator with different like capitalizations. Try those out because a lot of times you'll waste a lot of time trying to like, you know, grab a hash and, you know, uh, crack the hash and things like that. And it's just not really worth your time. So, you know, try your best to guess the password before and that'll save you a whole lot of time. Okay, so one of the nights, I want to say it was the night that I was up until three or four, I knew that I had a local privilege escalation exploit. I knew that it would work because I, I had already gathered a lot of information about the box, but I just couldn't get it to work. And I just kept banging my head against the wall, recompiling it. Um, and, and part of the problem was, was the box did not have the compiler natively. So I had to compile it on my machine and then transfer it over to the other machine. I kept doing that. I kept changing flags. I kept trying to find other like different versions of the exploit and probably transferred it like a dozen, two dozen times and just couldn't get it to work. And that was actually the first time that I've rage quit from the OSCP labs. I just completely was like, I, I can't, I can't keep doing this. So I went to bed, woke up the next morning and was making coffee actually when it hit me it's like well this is an exploit for a 32-bit machine and i bet money that i've got a 64-bit kali linux box and i'm not trying to cross compile it turns out that was exactly it i just needed to compile it as a 32-bit executable it's relatively easy you just install a couple of you know uh, new libraries for gcc and then you can compile it as a 32-bit executable on a 64-bit machine you transfer it over and bam, you got root. So that's another piece of advice. Just be aware when you're in situations like that where you have to compile on one, one machine and exploit on another. A lot of times those are two completely different environments and you need to be very aware of that. It's It, it can be a very frustrating mistake to make to kind of find that, you know, you've, you've got everything right except for that one little thing. You know, that's kind of one of the things that the OSCP tries to hammer in is those one little one-off things, you know, the, the little attention to details that you, you, you need to focus on in order to get root and, you know, just even get a initial access to a lot of them. Another thing that I'm kind of having issues with is a lot of times I'll find the initial exploit and it's very difficult to figure out where to go from there. So I actually struggled for a little while with a... Uh, basically a local file inclusion so I was uh, or not a local file inclusion a directory traversal um, and command injection exploit so I was able to inject commands but I wasn't really able to find a way to use that to get a shell or to find uh, the, the little proof file 
that's kind of one of the difficult things. You know, a lot of times finding the initial exploit isn't that hard. A lot of times it's like two Google searches away and you've got the initial exploit and you're crawling through directories and stuff like that. But going from directory traversal, for example, to shell is actually relatively difficult. It's something that a lot of blogs have covered, but not to the extent that I feel like they should. So that's kind of like an issue that I've got right now. I've probably got half a dozen more initial exploit vectors that I'm just trying to figure out how to either escalate privileges or how to go from like lo local file inclusion or uh, command injection or something like that to actual shell. So definitely if you're starting to prepare for the OSCP or if you're in it right now, try, try to focus on things like that. Try to figure out how to go from initial exploitation to shell. Um, that, that can be incredibly difficult. Even getting to the point where you can get a privilege escalation exploit on machine can be difficult. I think that's about it, actually. I, you know, I went over a little bit of the advice that I had and kind of the issues that I've had personally, I guess. But thank you guys for all of the support. The support's been awesome. I, I've jumped like over 200 subscribers since I started this series, and that's really cool for such a nerdy kind of channel that I've got. The comments have been great. Uh, a couple of people have sent me questions for the Q&A that I plan on answering later. I'm going to probably do another Q&A video this week if I can find time. But the support has been really great, guys. And uh, I really appreciate all of the likes and the comments and the subscriptions that I've gotten. Um, just keep showing support and I'll keep, I, I'll keep putting up content like this. Thank you, guys, and take it easy.